So start with Sarah. So I'm Sarah Sharp. I work on USB support, specifically USB 3. And I do some power management within that as well. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Tejun, and I nowadays mostly spend my time working on C groups, control groups, resource management. Um, but I also work on work queues and peer-to-peer memory allocators, memory allocators and stuff. Nice to meet you. Your your mic is, is your mic on? How do I turn it on? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. And I'm Linus, and as I think Greg spoke the other day, I don't actually do any work anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, I just uh, I manage people. I turn to the dark side, and uh, and all I do is uh, merge other people's uh, uh, patches these days. I'm Greg. I am a maintainer of some subsystems, and I also release the stable kernels. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to start with some of the questions uh, right away. Um, first question, has Linux kernel development become more focused on embedded and moved away from our traditional kind of enterprise server thing? And how do we keep that in balance? Anybody want to start? Um, I mean, embedded today is what enterprise was five years ago. I mean, you have a quad core in your pocket. Um, but no, the fun thing about Linux is all the changes that you make have to work on all of the things. So the enterprise guys didn't care about power management, but the embedded guys did. It turned out the embedded people got power management in the kernel, and all the enterprise people were like, wow, you saved us a couple million dollars in our data centers. Thank you. Um, so it works for everything. So enterprise is the same as embedded these days, and it works for everything. Yeah, I mean, if you look at just the last merge window, most of the actual code was the embedded side. But that's mainly because the embedded side has all these wild and wacky devices. And most of the kernel code these days is device drivers. Uh, but at the same time, while the embedded side and ARM gets a lot of uh, like mind share these days, uh, another feature we did was scalability to uh, like 200 core machines that, that people are looking at in the in the corporate world. So it's, we have a pretty good balance, I think. So the, the embedded people might outnumber us, but they haven't conquered us yet. Yeah. No. I mean, the embedded people have numbers, but at the same time, I have to say, the embedded people are very fractioned. Right. And they all fight with each other, too. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff going on. And, and it's actually getting much better than it used to be. But, uh, but there's. Uh, the, the big machines are still where a lot of large companies put a lot of effort in. And they seem to be more streamlined and know what they're doing sometimes. Other comments? So um, I don't necessarily think that um, people need to do anything like, special to, to match the balance. Because like, as the embedded world becomes more and more important, I mean, there's more resource to it. There's more engineers to it. And if I look at the patches, like, even for World Q coming in, um, like way back, there were like, you know embedded changes. The changes coming from embedded world would be like really fringe, you know, fractured thing, which doesn't make any sense in general sense in, in general environment. But like nowadays, I mean, there are like a lot more engineers, uh, and of course, if you have more engineers, you have more experienced ones, and and you have like these changes which are generally uh, generally useful. So I think the balance is kind of you know finding itself as you know the the, the amount of resource, engineering resource. Um, um, coming in from embedded world is you know, increasing. So I don't really think there's anything um, you know, special that we need to do. To I, I think if so as a, a driver maintainer, I do have to balance. You know, I, I test all of my code on you know, my desktop machine, but then I also have to balance the, you know, the XHCI platform driver as well that's a non-PCI driver. So that's in my mind as I'm testing and, and looking at code, like, is it going to break the embedded side? It's definitely more prominent in my mind these days. OK. So uh, something that we had a, a lot of positive feedback last year at uh, LinuxCon in San Diego was the Linux community has been growing in scope and scale and diversity over years. Um, how have we, 
how, how, do you, how do you give us a score? How, how are we doing in growing? Uh, Sarah, you were involved with some Linux Foundation programs with interns, uh, getting more women in open source. Sure. Comments about that? Uh, so, so last year, one of the things we discussed was that uh, we bring in a lot of new people into the kernel, and people do one-off patches. But there really needs to be a way for people to get a larger, beefier project uh, within the kernel and get some one-on-one some, uh, -on -one mentorship. So one of the things that we that I coordinated this year was uh, I coordinated the Linux kernel project under the FOSS Outreach Program for Women. And that's a, a three-month internship program for women to get involved in open source projects. They get paid $5,000, and they get a mentor in the community to help them take on a larger project. So this is part of getting them actual mentors and getting them into projects, and then getting them jobs in projects as well. We have uh, two interns here that are going to present about what they worked on in this uh, internship program over the summer. So if you want to come to that, that's uh, next session. And, and um, they're both looking for jobs. And they're both looking for jobs if people want to hire some <laughs> kernel hackers. Comments about diversity, or? I was one of the mentors. I had an uh, intern, so she did great. I mean, she had 60 patches in this last merge window, so that's good. Wow. <laughs> Pardon me? They're in the staging tree, yeah. hey. But well, she took a TTY driver. Some people accuse me of making her do really, really mean stuff, and I apologize to Lidza if she's out here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, I, I keep track of all the kernel statistics, and something interesting happened in this last merge window. It turned out in the Czech Republic, a uh, university professor made all their students get a patch merged into the kernel. <laughs> that was one of their assignments. And uh, we got about 20 different patches, and about five of them, you know, three to five of them said this was really easy. It was not hard at all. Thank you very much for getting a, letting me get a good grade, and I'm going to keep doing it. So they did. Some of them were just spelling fixes. Some of them were real code fixes. So um, that was a great. And that professor did a wonderful job. I'm real so happy to see so apparently I, I, we weren't that scary. We're right? not scary. We're yeah. not scary for that. For, yeah, so as, as part of the outreach program for women, on the Kernel Newbies page, if you look at the page for the outreach program, there's actually a first patch tutorial that walks you through you know, base Linux install, what packages you need to install, you know, some basic Git commands, and how to make a well-formatted patch and, and work with the community to send it. So you know, we have good t better tutorials now because of that. I also want to say that the OPW interns are doing real work. Uh, one of our interns is working up on speeding up x86 boot process by doing you know, parallel boot. And so there are some big, bigger picture uh, things that our interns are working on. I mean, I'd like to say that the kernel in, I mean, if you just look at the numbers, we have an amazing amount of developers. And the kernel is. In some respects, it's a hard project to get involved with because it's just very big and very complicated. In other respects, it's actually, of all the open source projects, it's somewhat easier than many others because we have so many different things you can do. I mean, there are people who come in because they're interested in doing drivers. There are people who are coming in because they're interested in low-level CPU stuff. There are people doing all these small incremental things, especially in the staging tree, trying to clean stuff up. So the kernel, in many respects, has more opportunities for new people to come in than many other open source projects. And I think that's why you can see that the kernel actually has a ton of developers. And we get patches from 1,000 people every single release, while many other open source projects are really struggling to just find five people who are involved. Uh, so we're I mean, people talk about how hard the kernel is, but at the same time, just look at the numbers. It can't be that hard to get involved. So um, first of all, I didn't do anything to increase, uh, encourage new developers, so I'm sorry. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I want to make like, two observations. The first, of, the first thing is like what Vino said, that if you look at like, any, any part of kernel, that is usually any part of code pass, there's usually like, between zero and two people who are paying attention, attention to their part of code. And it's not a lot of people. And a lot of, I mean, if you look at, if you go into a file and try to spend like two hours within, trying to understand a certain part of logic, like in 70% of cases, you will go like, oh my god, this is stupid. So um, seriously, I mean, there are like so many things to do. So there are always opportunities. And the second thing that I want to, um, I, I observed over the um, course of this year was that um, 
that I, I'm noticing a lot more uh, Chinese developers coming in, especially from Huawei, during the past like two months. I think they're like doing something systematic, like creating a, a new color team. Are there people from Huawei here? Yes. Yeah, you guys are doing a good job. So, um, <laughs> I mean, it's really encouraging because, I mean, I can see that, you know, like many of these guys, some of these guys are NS, like not really experienced in how this thing works, the development process or how the environment is set up, how, how, how the, you know, common conventions are set up, but they're still trying to like systematically um, raise new kind of developers. And, and I think China is like uh, really um, in a good position to, to build a new you know, group of uh, corner developers because of they have so many people and like very strong uh, technology industry there. You know, they have uh, R&D centers from you know, all the big companies and local companies. So yeah, I think it's very increasing. And um, yeah, I think we're gonna see a lot more new developers from you know, new demographics. Yeah, I think it's hard to think of a place in the world we don't have some patches coming from these days. I mean, yeah. we've gotten from Antarctica before too. Yeah. Antarctica. Antarctica sent patches. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure who this question was focused at, but apparently there's an opening for a CEO at Microsoft. <laughs> 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 was there any interest from, from our panelists? I'll move right along. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, one, one other question. Actually, this, this is a question Jim got asked yesterday, or asked yesterday. Um, what's the most embarrassing place you've ever seen Linux used in person? <laughs> embarrassing. I, I, so I saw it once on a, a like the infotainment uh, system yeah. crashed, and then yeah, I saw the Tux logo, and that was kind of embarrassing because it crashed because I, I saw the logo. So it's not so much. I've seen that too. And yeah. what's really embarrassing about that is when you see the kernel messages scroll by, you see version 2.2.18 or yes. something, <laughs> and it's like, Christ, people, that was 10 years ago. Give me a chance. <laughs> So, so sometimes the embarrassing moment is not so much that they're using Linux, it's that they're using a really, really old version of Linux. Yeah, that's happened to me more than once. Usually right after I've introduced myself as working at Red Hat and on <laughs> Linux to the guy sitting next to me yeah. and said, you guys. Yeah. So, um, so uh, another question. Um, looking beyond your lifetime, your dust, what are your hopes and expectations for Linux next 10, 15, 20, 30 years? Some of us have to go further than uh, Sarah say for getting to that dust stage. <laughs> Me, oh, I just, I, I mean, my big goal is that I want to see Linux continue to succeed and we have to continue to change to work with all the hardware and all the devices out there. And we, if we stop changing, we stop our rate of change and stop doing that, we will die. So I mean to sure that our com community keeps growing and that we keep changing along with the rest of the world. That's my worries. That's what I want to see happen. Yeah, I mean, I can't really argue with that. One of the fun things has been that, uh, especially the hardware platforms that Linux has been running on, and through the hardware platforms, then the usage that Linux has seen has been changing so much that despite doing this for 22 years, it's very different right. today than it was 10 years ago, than it was 20 years ago. And I, the only thing I can hope for is that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it's going to be different still, just because of the different usage patterns and the hopefully hardware innovation doesn't stop just because shrinking stops. So um, for me, the short-term goal is getting C group in some usable form. Um, and hopefully you'll live long, outlive that, that goal. Hopefully that won't yeah. take 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, that, that's the thing. I mean, I really don't have like this long-term view. And, and I think that's the same with the uh, last question with embedded and, and um, um, server space. It's just that um, it's almost impossible to have a long-term view which doesn't, will not be contradicted by the reality. And the best you can do is that, you know, um, just follow the path of evolution and try to you know, adapt as fast as you can and then try to find the, what the next step is. And I think right, right now for me, the next step is getting like resource management and C group in some usable form. And after that, I will find something interesting. Yeah, then. 
I, I think for me, what, what I'd like to do, you know, we, Greg and Linus talked about getting Linux to work on all hardware and being inclusive to all hardware. I like to make sure that our community is inclusive to all people that want to contribute as well. And so the getting more diversity, getting more diverse voices in our community is something I, I would like to see continue on. So um, just a reminder, um, people are still collecting questions if you have them. Um, but another question, uh, the kernel community, and, and I've actually observed this and kind of nudged the people who have the uh, misfortune to report to me at, at Red Hat, we're all very focused on kernel mechanisms, but Linux is an ecosystem, including user space. How do we keep that balance? I mean, are there u burning user space issues or application issues that we as kernel uh, developers need to be more aware of or concerned with? Well, that's why we have the plumbers conference, right? It's the kernel and the plumbing above the kernel and the system D and new dev and all the stuff interaction. That's why we're all sitting down for three days and hashing it all out again. Right. I mean, that's the great, we're all working together on that. And there are people that cross those boundaries and there's some of us that just stay down in the kernel. So there's a whole large community here working on that. Right. So that's a very important thing. I have to say, I sometimes hope that, OK, we have a lot of kernel developers. I hope some of them would go into user space, not because I don't want to have them, but because I see all these things that a lot of user space projects do. And I say, Christ, people, why are you doing it that way? We know how to do it right, and we know how to not break compatibility. And then I see these user space projects that break compatibility every single version and say, hey, we need to redesign this and break every single user. And I'm telling, I'm, I'm, I'd really like to see some of the kernel uh, culture spread Move into up. user space. And if that means that some of the kernel people have to go to user space to, to spread the word, <laughs> I'll, I'll happily lose them if, if that improves user space. Yeah. So um, I think by my opinion, it would be a bit differ different. Um, the, the thing is that like, if you talk to people who are working on um, base systems right, or, or in user space, you know, desktop or whatever, um, while it's true that you know, they don't have as much resource that we do, and they probably have you know, worse, thing, worse practice than in some, some aspects than we do, but there are also a lot of things that we need to learn from user space, I think. That, that like if you talk to like how how some of the kernel features are designed to user space guys, then a lot of it is just barely usable, not usable, and and I think we just need like a lot more communication between um, the people who are actually using our kernel features and and the people who are you know, developing the kernel features, and and I, I think we kind of lose need to lose the mindset that you know we are somehow like uh, better doing better in, in most things <laughs> than user space. I mean, it's, it's just like there are like very different approaches taken. And, and, and in, in many aspects, they are more advanced like in taking in like newer developments in software engineering or whatnot. So I think it would be very beneficial if you can like talk more. I think that one of the areas that, that user space and kernel really, really needs to collaborate on is power management. You know, we can have the best power management in the kernel in the world. We can get into the deepest C states. We can have the best USB power management. But as soon as user space starts pulling your USB devices, your power is just going to go to crap. So it's, it's, it's a definite balance that we need to communicate back and forth between user space people and kernel people as well. So some of the interesting technologies, I mean, Linus, you mentioned hardware innovation. <clears throat> Later this week, we'll be talking about new classes of memory parts like persistent DRAM and how we handle it in file and storage uh, in plumbers. Anything in the horizon that you're currently worked in, working on or worried about that uh, is the most exciting and kind of game-changing technology? Throw persistent memory as a change. What would you do with that? Persistent memory is interesting. So that's, yeah, we've heard that a long time. Um, it's interesting to see it come out now and how it's going to work. I am glad other people are doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thunderbolt 2 is coming out. I heard just heard about that. So that's another faster. They keep trying to chase after USB. Yeah. So we got that working the other day. The Intel did. And, um, USB 3.1 is coming out. USB 3.1 is coming out to try and combat Thunderbolt 2. <laughs> 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 it's, um, 
it, it'll it'll show up in cinemas for over the Christmas holiday, right? Yeah, it will. So, I actually, uh, I'm personally more interested. It, this is a slightly longer time frame, but on the five to ten year time frame scale, I'm very interested to see what and how the industry actually reacts to the fact that soon we will actually come against some physical limits. And uh, people used to be talking about having thousands of cores on one die because you keep shrinking. And those people clearly had no idea about physics uh, because we won't be shrinking for very much longer. It's getting physically harder and harder and economically more and more expensive. And we've gotten so used to the fact that all these, like the reason Linux runs really well on cell phones is that cell phones grew up, right? They're already thousands of times more powerful than the original machine that Linux came to be on. And we've gotten used to the fact, and we don't even think about it. I mean, people pay lip service to the whole Moore's Law thing. But five, 10 years, it's going to be tough. And, and that's going to affect us in the kernel land, especially because we are so, we're kind of the layer between the hardware and the software. And what happens when hardware doesn't improve so Magically quickly make anymore. us faster. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to be interesting. But it's, it's, it's a slightly longer time scale. And it might not be five, 10 years. Maybe it's 15. But it's going to happen. I'm just happy that Sara is dying out. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he was the maintainer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the maintainer, and life is dying. So, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting because like everything is now converging. Like the physical interconnects is not not everything, but a lot of them are converging on the Saturday Express, and especially um, uh, not Saturday Express, but the PCI Express. I mean, Thunderbolt is PCI Express, mm -hmm. and um, especially um, we are seeing a lot of um, developments in the storage stack. And traditionally, our storage stack has been really slow, something, you know, because the disks were so slow that it didn't really matter how we did it. Uh, but nowadays, I mean, it's, it's being pushed and pushed harder and harder. And like, there are now storage devices coming out, which can do like tens of millions of IOPS per second. And, you know, our IOPS stack is way outdated. So, um, the ANSI is working on this um, block multi queue thing, which um, is probably going to um, solve a lot of those issues. But I'm really interested in seeing how that eventually develops. And, um, and I think it's also going to affect that how we generally perceive storage. I mean, we used to have like this really um, complex hierarchical um, you know, complex arrangements because we could spend the um, CPU time to, to optimize IO accesses. But nowadays, it doesn't really matter anymore. So it's going to change it somehow. And I think it's going to be simpler uh, in the future. So. I'm kind of really excited to see how this going to fan out. We're already having trouble doing 500,000 IOs a yes. second, let alone 5 million IOs a second to a device. So we have to change something. I think the interesting thing is you know, there, there's all these new you know, hardware things that we're going to do. But really, to me, the interesting thing is what we do with the hardware. I mean, if you look at something like Google Glass, the hardware is really not that advanced. I mean, it's, it's basically a Panda board. But what you do with it is very interesting. And so you know, I, I'd like to see, it's going to be interesting to see what we end up doing with Linux and where it goes and you know, what we end up doing in the user space with it. So I think this question is directed mostly at Linus. And, and a, a slight variation of it is, have you, fa have you fulfilled your ambition of diving all around the world? And if not, which, which oh. sites do we need to have conferences at so you can finish that list? <laughs> <laughs> so we do need more conferences in the Caribbean, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that said, apparently I have been diving enough because two days ago when I was on this boat, it turns out I knew the boat captain because he used to be on a boat in Hawaii. <laughs> so it's uh, when you start recognizing boat captains around the world, there's something really, really right. <laughs> yeah. So. Anybody else have conference sites uh, that they need to add to the list? Hawaii. Hawaii? Hawaii. <laughs> Yeah, so this question, have, have any of you been approached by the US for a back door? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. No. 
so. Not that I can talk about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So going back to uh, diversity and growing the community, I think it'd be interesting, looking back at your own career, what got you interested in software and eventually in kernel programming? Start with? After that. So um, my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time in the university, she um, came back. She had a class that had a bunch of lectures that happened. And I was into computers, and um, she came back and said, hey, I heard this strange bearded guy gave this talk about this free software stuff. You heard about that before? I said, no, I hadn't. And so I looked into that, and that was Richard Stallman. Um, and that was a long, long time ago. That was the same time I was in the university as he was. Um, and then later on, um, a lot longer, um, my wife and daughter went on vacation for a week, and um, I didn't have anything to do. So I was like, oh, I had been using Linux for a long time. So I sat down, and I wrote a driver. I was bored. So I came back, and I'd written the driver. So my wife, by leaving me alone, let me write some Linux software. So. So, so boredom drove you to it. Boredom-driven software, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I had no, not, I, I think the major reason I did cur the kernel was I had not enough money. So, and that was even before I couldn't afford a Unix for my machine, but even before I'd never been able to afford like buying games, like all my friends played games with their computers. I didn't have any, so I had to type them in myself, right? So I, I think to some degree it's not boredom, but necessity that necessity. made you start something. Right, right Tejan, can you, can you one-up boredom, necessity, slash poverty? Um, <laughs> I think actually I'm, I'm going to be a bit serious about this. Right? <laughs> anyway, so... Um, so I, I, I always have been a nerd. I mean, there's no question about it. So um, when I was young, like, you know, five, six years old, I have one sister. And like when your extended family gathers, right, I mean, they, they tell the youngsters to do something, like to sing, to dance, whatever. And like, you know, after like all that is over, then the, um, the, my aunts, my, my uncles would tell me that you have no chance, but you have to study. I mean, you have no talent whatsoever. So I mean, that's what, what, I, you know, what I heard while growing up. So. I mean, I was, I guess I was just a natural born nerd. But I mean, so I was always, always into programming and, you know, computer and stuff. But I always wanted to do operating systems. I don't know why. It's just like, I don't know. It's just, uh, I was just interested in the, you know, how it actually works on the hardware. And I always wanted to do operating systems. But um, I'm from Korea. And while I kind of graduate, you know, kind of go to school in Korea, I had really no chance of doing, you know, any operating system um, development without, you know, doing a, 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 a you know, master's degree in U.S. I mean, how am I going to get a job in Microsoft? How, how am I going to get a job with, in, uh, with Sun at the time um, if I don't have any, you know, degree in U.S.? I don't really speak, you know, English. It's just not, it was just not going to work, and, and, and I still really wanted to do it. And there was Linux. I mean, it was completely open. I mean, it didn't matter where I come from or, or you know, what degree I had. And, and that's how I got into Linux. And I, I, I too, till this day, I, I just really love the fact that it doesn't have that artificial barrier of entrance. I mean, if you can do it, then you can do it. I mean, it doesn't really matter who you are, you know, where you came from. And, and that's just an awesome thing. So, you know, if you're interested, just, you know, give it a shot. It might work out. Just go and do it. And yeah. after you... Be, after you've transformed yourself into the upstream presence, getting a job doing that and getting paid is, is a lot easier. Yeah, it's really yeah. easy. <laughs> I don't know why. People, yeah. I, I, I don't know. People like to give money to me. So. so I think I can top boredom and poverty. I got involved in Linux because my uh, then boyfriend, now husband, was involved in the Portland State Aerospace Society, and they build open source rockets. And so I actually got Linux running on my machine because I wanted to build USB sensors for this, this Linux-based rocket that was going to go 24,000 feet in the air. Were you afraid that if you didn't do it right, it would crash back on your house? Oh, we've had the rocket crash before and not, you know, and, and it got kind of squished. But, you know, it, it's just an experiment. It's something fun to do. Yeah. So uh, another question from the audience. Um, what do you think about software abstraction, virtual servers, virtual software-defined networks, software-defined storage? The turtles all the way down, something. <laughs> it's it, some things make sense. I mean, virtualization containers are a good solution for a lot of problems. The cloud. I mean, these guys have been doing this for over 40 years ago. I mean, these are good, well-proven 
um, designs and ideas of how to com how to compartmentalize things and do computing. Um, so I mean, it's a well known, well thought out, well researched area. It's how to do things. But still, running on bare metal is fun. Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm with Tejan. It's I. Part of the reason I got into it was playing with hardware. All these virtualization stuff, I don't want to have anything to do with it because I want to, I want to run on bare hardware. That's where the real excitement is. Real men and women do that, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think we are still in the process of finding out how it all works out. Um, and um, I don't know, I really don't have any thought about it. Sorry. I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, where virtualization goes. You know, if people start having, you know, dual OS tablets where they've got Windows running on on Linux in there, it'll be interesting to see what happens. All right. So another another audience question: Is there anything you want to tell everyone about explaining how difficult it is to be a kernel maintainer? What makes your life easy? What makes your life hard? I get a whole hour-long talk on that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have documentation on how to do patches, how to send them. Read them. Read that. I mean, that, that's the easiest thing. You can, if you read that and follow that, it makes my life so much easier. Yeah. Linus, anything you especially hated? Our seat. One of my main, major sources of stress is when, and I'm looking at you, James, <laughs> <laughs> is is when people send me last minute stuff and want me to merge stuff. And, uh, and then I have to hurry. And I hate being in a hurry and uh, feeling like I'm on a deadline. Uh, so one of the things people should do is prepare beforehand and send it out when it's ready. And uh, if it's not ready in a timely manner, wait until the next release. So um, being a maintainer, I think, I think like there are like a lot of conventions and you know just the people, you know, how to interact with say Andrew Morton, how to interact with you know Greg, how to interact with Linus, and like these things are I don't know, it's difficult to document, and 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 like those small tricks, those small conventions, those small you know acquaintances, those things add up to make the daily life of maintaining stuff. Not so hard eventually. I mean, it 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 takes some person, a person, a new maintainer, maybe you know six months, a year, and you know the person would make several mistakes in the in the course of that time. But I don't really think it's that hard to pick up. But I think what makes uh, maintaining a subsystem uh, more difficult is when you have to make like long-term decisions and and try to drive people you know towards a certain direction. And with, of course, not everyone is happy about it, and and you know you are not you you yourself are not even sure whether you know this is always the right direction or not. So those things, you know, those like long-term decisions can be more difficult, I think. But like daily life of you know being a maintainer, I don't really find that too too harsh or too difficult. I think as a maintainer, the the hardest thing that I have difficulty with is I need people to explain why I need to apply a particular patch. It's not enough that you send me a patch that it's perfect. You need to tell me why it fixes this particular bug and how you trigger it. You basically have to you know, use your, your persuasive skills to, to tell me why I should be, care about this particular patch. Um, and so I think that that's something that a lot of people don't get when they do first patch development. They don't understand that it's not about getting your patch in, it's about convincing me that there is a problem, that you've solved that problem. I, I, I agree very much with Sarah. Another thing that I personally find hard to deal with are these drive-by shootings when somebody throws a patch over the, the fence and then doesn't understand that in order to be a useful kernel developer, it's not enough to just write the code and send it out there. You have to write the code. You have to explain why. You have to answer questions when somebody asks, why did you do this? You have to be ready to not just do the code. You have to be ready to maintain your own piece of code. Maybe if it's just for one single, like, uh, 
patch you're sending, you, it's only a couple of days of answering questions about it, but it's even better if you're making it clear that, hey, if there are problems, I will take care of them and make it clear that you are responsible for the code you sent in. All right. So uh, one, I think we're close to the end of the hour. So maybe a last question to wrap up with. I'll, I'll combine two questions. How do you spend your non-kernel hacking, non-software hacking time? And is there anything that, you would, that would draw you away from uh, hacking on Linux as, as a, as a full-time job? Well, I used to joke that Linux was my hobby, and then I became my job, so I lost a hobby. <laughs> um, so I moved a couple years ago up to Seattle, and we're near water, so I started building a kayak, a um, wooden kayak. And it's supposed to take about 50 to 60 hours. Uh, like my daughter likes reminding people, it took me three years. <laughs> but it's finished, it's done, so I like, and then she likes reminding people I've only used it three times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, I need a new hobby, it's done now. So if you need, so if you need a professionally built kayak, Greg's the guy to go no, to. No, 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 yeah. so, uh, yeah, so my wife is like, you're not building the rest of a family one, we're out going and buying the rest of them. So they did that, so, um, no, and uh, no, I love doing this, this is fun. Yeah. Well, I do my diving, I do yeah. have a regular, life outside of Linux also. Uh, and I don't really see any project coming along that would be more interesting than Linux. So I can't imagine what would fill the void in my life if I didn't have Linux to work on. It's not a bad job if you can get it, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I moved to New York like one month ago, and I'm having a blast there. So is there like anyone from New York here? Raise your hands. Yay, wow. you are living in an awesome city. So, so I've been to, um, I mean, I, I, I usually mountain bike almost every week or every other week. But um, these days I'm spending a lot of time like just hanging, hanging out in the city. And um, last weekend I went to um, Comedy Cellar, which is a comedy club, a famous fam a comedy club in New York. And I already been there three times, although I was living there only for one month. Um, and I saw Louis C.K. there in person, so I just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm telling this to everyone. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm trying to, like, having a life out of this, you know, nerdy sphere. And, um, and as for job, I mean, I'm, I'm so happy with my job that I cannot really see myself doing anything else. I mean, I, I cannot even imagine how I would spend my life without, you know, hacking on Conan. So, so as your manager, I don't have to worry you're going to run off and do stand-up. No. no. <laughs> yes. I, I'm just not talented. I mean, my aunts and, you know, uh, uncles were right. I, I have no talent. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of a, a geeky geek. I mean, I, I do uh, bicycling and I do gardening, but then I also play Magic the Gathering and I do Dungeons and Dragons on the weekend. And so I just like doing geeky things. Well, thank you. And I think that's, that's it. Okay. <laughs> So I want to, before you sit down, so I want to I wanna sneak in one last question because uh, many of you may not know this, but uh, Greg and I do this thing called the Greg and Jim Show, where we go around all over the world and we sit down and we talk with companies who want to get better at participating in kernel development and in fact want to integrate upstream code contributions into their business process, you know, when they're getting a product ready to go to market, you know, how do I get a patch that I need to ship a product ready also simultaneously for the mainline? So any advice, this is the question we always get, right? And uh, I thought I'd take this opportunity to get some advice for those companies, engineers, the guys who are working on getting the kernel ready for a product or whatnot, how they can also integrate that process into the mainline. Any, any advice for these folks? Um, get it involved really, really, really early in your hardware design cycle before you have silicon. Get patches upstream. I mean, I talk about when you should submit patches. It should be after or right really, really early. Um, other companies really understand this. I like giving an example of Intel. One, a couple of kernel releases ago, we ripped code out of the kernel for an Intel chip that never shipped. <laughs> Intel is that far ahead of everybody else. Um, so companies need to be involved really, really early in their design cycle and their integration cycle to get stuff upstream. Because it takes a while. It takes six months to get new features and new stuff in. They need to realize that. 
because other companies do realize that. Yeah. And also the not just really early, but really be involved and not just say build your patches inside the company and then you're of the opinion that, hey, we did this perfect solution for our problem. Why aren't you taking it? Uh, when you then give the kernel community this fait accompli, uh, this, this thing that solves your problem but solves nobody else's problems. So you, you need to be aware of the fact that in order to get things merged, you need to solve not your own problem, well, not just your own problem, but also realize that the world is bigger than your company and try to solve things in a way where it makes sense for other people, even if it primarily is for your own situation. Um, one thing that I want to say is that um, you probably, if, if this is like the first time that um, your organization is sending patches upstream, that it is almost essential to budget extra time and resources to do that. Because it's, I mean, it's not like, you know, if uh, your manager ask you, asks you that, um, you know, do we want to open source it? And you say, you know, yeah, sure. And we can just send it and forget about it. And it's not going to happen that way. You're going to have to send it and you're going to have to follow up. And that's probably going to take a significant amount of, you know, your time and resource. <laughs> and which is a good thing, but you just need to make sure that you have that budget in your in your timeline, or you insist on that you know is this is an, an extra effort that you need to take on and make sure that it's known throughout the scheduling or to your management or whatever, and that will make your life a lot easier if you're thinking about it. I think that uh, a lot of companies that they need to contribute like this giant chunk of code. What they don't realize is when they walk in with that giant chunk of code that you're walking into an existing community. We have no trust in you. We don't know your skills. And so you're going to get really scrutinized. So one way that you can you know, kind of ease that process is to work with the community beforehand. As Greg said, you know, bounce your hardware designs off of, off of kernel maintainers. You know, see, you know, work with them to design new APIs rather than designing your APIs behind closed doors and then trying to get it in the kernel. And maybe do small patches in the community you know you're going to need to contribute in eventually so that we know we can trust you with the process. We know you're going to be around for a while. And so you can build up your trust with that community. You guys will be happy. I actually talked to the vendor who worked on that airline system. And they're now employing this methodology. So you may see a more recent kernel version next time. And I'm hoping it won't crash. Uh, but at least you, you may or may not see it. So it's good news there. I want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, we're going to go and take a break here. And then the sessions start uh, right after that. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>